after my near death experience, I was a mess. You know, people are like, oh, that's great. You know, you were with God. And and I'm like, okay, imagine a baby in its mother's arms, as loved as it's ever going to be. And somebody just ripping that baby out of its mother's arms and then throwing it into this hostile environment. That's what it felt like. Welcome to part two in the finale of the incredible near-death experience story with Penny Whitbrot. If you missed part one, you can find a link to the episode in the show notes. Thanks for tuning in. What did you feel? I mean, what was the feeling? It was awe. I always tell people the one thing that I know that I know in my knower <laughs> is that I am not God. Because a lot of people will have a near-death experience and they're like, oh, we're all God. And I'm like, okay, I don't know that that's what they mean, or maybe it it is hard to put words on it. So I can see where it gets rough trying to explain it. But in that moment, I knew that I was not God, that I was just this small speck in the universe that this God, for some reason, cared about, you know, and he didn't have to. I'm pretty insignificant in the, you know, in the whole scheme of things. But I knew that he was there and I knew that he loved me. And I'm talking loved me like adored me, was thrilled to see me. And I hadn't expected that. I had expected to be overwhelmed and have all those feelings about him. I didn't expect it to come from him first. And there was something about that that just set me off balance. And so I immediately kind of got defensive because I'm like, I could feel him knowing me and it just, the whole thing was really weird. I always tell people, I'm like, you know, So Don and I met, we've been together 12 years. I'll be 52 this year. And when you get together later in life, it's not like when you get together when you're 20 and everything stills where it's supposed to be. The girls are saluting the sun, you know, everything's tight and compact. It's it's all gone downhill, right? After three kids. And, (laughs) And so you're dating this guy. And, you know, guys, for those of you who aren't aware, they make all kinds of devices to make us, to get us put together into what you see out and about that's not what's going on. <laughs> it's scary. And so you're thinking to yourself for anybody who's dated later in life, you know, at some point I'm going to have to get naked in front of this man and my boobs are going to hit my knees and that's going to be it. That's, he's just going to be like, oh man, I had, I don't know how you pulled that, that mirage off for the whole time we were dating, but I was not expecting that. And it's kind of like what it's like when you're in front of God, because You know, we go to God and we pray and we go to church, but we're not being real. You know, there's a certain amount of things you're willing to confess or willing to admit or even discuss with them. You know, you put your head down and pray because everybody else is putting their head down and praying, but you're thinking about groceries or why your kids can't sit still and, you know, you're slapping them and telling them to be good. You know, you're just, there's so much here that's so distracting. But in that moment where I could feel him knowing me all all the way to my core, everything about me, every thought, everything, I pulled back. And I knew that he couldn't do that without my permission. Or maybe he could, but he wouldn't. And so I pulled back and I just wasn't sure, you know, I had some issues with God. And I wasn't sure that I felt safe letting him in like that. And so he's there with me and we're going to go through not really a life review, but just a couple of things. And and I'm like, oh, great, you know. And then I, I think of a couple good ones, and I'm like, okay, maybe he'll bring that one up. That's a super good one. I'm proud of that. <laughs> Just cherry um, picking. Right, right. <laughs> like, oh, that one. And so the scene opens up, and it's like you're there, but you know you're an observer. And the first thing was a good scene, and it was me in this grocery store in this little save-a-lot in the little town that we lived in. And there was a woman in line in front of me, and she was 72 cents short. And she was trying to figure out what to put back. And as a single mom... I knew what that was like and how embarrassing it is. And it's just, it's embarrassing. I I just remember being so ashamed that I had to put something back. And I could see her going through it and I knew exactly what she was thinking. She's like, well, the kids like the macaroni and cheese. I don't really need this moisturizer, you know, and you always, you always short yourself because you're going to do the best for your kids. And, and so I fish around and I find the money and I hand it to her and she's like, oh no, no. And this is where we are in the world. She was ashamed to take 72 cents. I mean, what is that off me? That's nothing. That's nothing off most people. She would rather just go without some basic thing that she needs because we have it so ingrained in us, this idea of independence and to have to need or rely on anybody else's weakness. And it's shameful. And I, I remember feeling that in myself under those same circumstances and just being profoundly grieved 
that other people felt that way too. Because every time you open yourself up and expose your vulnerability and let someone else help you, that grows them spiritually. So this thing where we don't reach out to each other and we don't ask for help and we don't call when we're having trouble, you know, we don't want to bother anybody. We are spiritually draining the world by doing that because that is not how we're supposed to function. So, you know, there I am with her and and I'm like, wow, this seems like a small thing. I hadn't even remembered this till you showed me. And I remember those words echoing, small thing, small thing, small thing. And then the whole scene opens up and it's her years down the road and she's working in a food pantry and she's handing out groceries. And this woman comes in with exactly the same feeling that she and I had both had at other times in our life, ashamed that she's having to go and get free food. And the lady was like, it's okay. It's okay. I've been there. It's all right. I'm going to help you out. Everything's going to be okay. And I'm like, 72 cents. That's huge. Who knew? You know, I mean, I would have picked a million other things that I had done that seemed bigger, but that was the thing. And he's like, you've got to realize your purpose is whatever I put in front of you that day. Whatever person crosses your path, everybody thinks it's this one big thing. And, you know, what's your gift? And that's the thing you're supposed to, it's not, it's a million things every day. It's that person that something's tugging at you to talk to that you don't talk to because you don't know them. It's kind of getting over ourselves to be able to see that and see where God needs you to work because we all have that. You know, like I'll think there, there's some people that live across the street and one day I was looking out the window and it was awful outside and their flag had fallen and it was about to touch the ground. And, you know, my dad was a Navy SEAL. My son was a Marine. I was in the Army. And I'm like, oh my gosh, their flag's going to touch the ground. And it, you know, without even thinking, I ran over there. The pole was broken. So I took it apart and unscrewed it and set it on the porch, brought the flag back. The end of it was like muddy where it had hit the porch, laundered it properly, folded it properly, put it in a box. And when Don got home, I'm like, hey, will you take this over to them? You know, I didn't want it to hit the ground. And so you have all these little opportunities. You know, you see somebody's trash cans laying on its side every day. It puts value out into the world spiritually. And if enough people do that, it starts changing the mindset and it's proven to be true. And so I just, I don't know, it just seemed like a small thing and it wasn't the thing I was proudest of by any, but the ripple effect was huge. And so then I'm like, okay, well now we're going to have to go through bad things and boy, it seems like there's a lot of those to choose from. And so he pulls up this scene of this woman that I used to work with that I could not stand. She wasn't nice to the patients. She wasn't nice to the people she worked for. She was difficult. She'd have a patient on a bedpan. And if you've never sat on a bedpan, it is very uncomfortable. And if the call light went off for an hour because the tech couldn't get there, then that's how long the patient sat on it. And I just could never abide that. I'm like, no, the tech's busy. I can run in there in five minutes and do it. And, and so I just disliked her for that reason. And so God showed me her life. And he showed me all the horrible things her dad had done to her as a little girl. And I just was stunned. And I'm like, oh my gosh, she should be a monster considering what she endured as a little girl. And she grows up with nobody caring for her, the people that you're supposed to count on to love you, that you, that you don't have to invest in that. You know, you're a little kid, they just love you because you're their kid. It wasn't like that. He was his tool for pleasure. And, and I mean, how warped is that? And even with that going on, ever since she could remember when she gets grown up enough to be able to decide what she's going to do with her life, she wants to help people. Now, is she great at it? No. But in that moment, God was like, you need to learn to control your thoughts. So I've never been a person to gossip, and I hate gossip. I think it is the single most destructive thing that people do. And so I've never had a lot of female friends because females tend to gossip. And I just, people always thought I was weird. They would start talking trash about somebody, and I would just turn around and walk away. I wouldn't even say anything. And I'm like, you know what? If you're talking about her, you're talking about me. And even if you're not, you have a mean spirit. I know she can't hear you and thank God, but I'm hurting for her now. And I saw it so much in church and I just hated it. You know, and as a single mom, I got a lot of grief in church. Not that anybody would say, but you didn't get asked to certain things and you couldn't really volunteer for this thing or that thing because you, like church in Kentucky is way different than church in any other state I've ever lived in. Um, and it's good. There's good, definitely. I've been to some great churches, but the bad ones, boy, they leave a mark on you. And so I just, I felt like, because I had never said anything bad about that nurse that I hadn't really done anything wrong. And he said, you, you allowed yourself to entertain all these negative thoughts about her and to dislike her and to insult her in your own spirit, in your own mind. And that has energy. 
yes, there's more energy if you speak it and there's more energy if you act on it, but it all starts with a thought. And when you malign somebody like that with your mind and in your own spirit, it's not without effect on them. Their spirit senses it like that person looking at you from across the room and you look and you see who they are. She senses it. She senses that she's not good enough or she's just, you know, distasteful in your eyes or, you know, you don't think she's a good nurse. So rather than pour into her and find something positive to say or something, you know, or let me help you with that and, and model good, good patient care for her, you just took it on yourself to mentally hate on her. And that makes it harder for her to get out of who she is and, and, and be more. And so you cripple her journey when you do that. And it floored me because I'd always been so careful to not talk bad about people, but I had not been good about controlling my thoughts. And, and I mean, sometimes they're deserved. I know some really crappy people, um, but it doesn't help them get out of that. And, and it gets you kind of sucked into this negative thing where now you're working with this person and you're just, you know, you're grumbling the whole shift inside, you, you know, you're smiling and stuff, but inside you're super annoyed for a 12 hour shift and it takes a lot out of you. And I just thought it was interesting that that was the thing that he chose to show me, you know, about controlling my thoughts. And um, as somebody who has to kind of work to be present and not always in my head, that's important. In regards to those thoughts, did, did you have to figure out on your own how to do that? Or is it simply just noticing them and then flipping them? Like, what, what is your method yeah, now it's a to, practice. to control your thoughts? It's So it's kind of like meditating. I see it in marriages a lot. People... Like I have this friend, I have a girlfriend who I just love. And if we're going to, we do this like joking thing back and forth. So I'll say today on mansplaining with Don, <laughs> because Don always mansplains things to me, right? So one day I'm outside painting and, and I, I had finished and we had this tent set up for me to paint in. And I, so I'd finished, I was turning everything off. And then I looked and I thought I saw something on the painted service. And so I was, the, the outside light was on, but the lights inside the tent were. So I kind of got close to it and tried to brush it off to see what it was. And Don walks in and he's like, um, you know, you'd be able to see that better if you turned on the light. And I'm like, don't, don't say it. Just, just, he's just trying to be helpful. So I messaged Frida and I'm like, today on Mansplaining with Don, Don explains how light works. <laughs> <laughs> And he's not trying to be a jerk. He's trying to be helpful. He's a sweet, sweet guy. But those are the things that make you crazy. And what happens in marriage often is you get caught up in this focus of the things that that person does that make you nuts. And if you're not careful, you can grow hate for them and it can destroy a marriage. And so Don and I have talked about this a lot. And after my near-death experience, I was a mess. You know, people are like, oh, that's great. You know, you were with God. and and I'm like, okay, imagine imagine a baby in its mother's arms, as loved as it's ever going to be, and somebody just ripping that baby out of its mother's arms and then throwing it into this hostile environment. That's what it felt like. I'm like, everything here is harder. It's more painful. I was still super sick. It was hard. And so I like started looking into all these different faiths and religions, you know, trying to find truth and, and you know, what did I actually believe and, and what... What did I read that seemed right in my spirit? And, and Don came home one day and he said, you know what? Every day I'm worried that I'm going to come home and you're going to have shaved your head and, and you're going to have become a Buddhist monk. Well, now both of his parents are Methodist ministers. They've both since passed, but wonderful people. And I had read this book by um, Dr. Atwater and she was, it's something like 70% of people who have a near-death experience end up divorced. And I thought, wow, that's so tragic. And I looked at him and I said, I said, 70% of people who, who have a near-death experience end up being divorced. And I have to ask you, is God going to be the one thing that pulls us apart? So here we're, you know, we're back now and we've kind of gone through the good and the bad. And I realized that I have this opportunity to go deeper with God and I'm scared. I don't want to do it. And then like all of the things that I had held against him for all of the years just bubbled up in my chest and I was angry. He was kind of expressing this love that he had for me. And, and I said, you know what? I, no, I'm calling BS. I don't believe that. And he didn't like flinch or anything. Like he didn't love me less. He didn't reject me for having doubts, which I just, that wasn't my understanding of God at all. And, and he was going to hear me out. And I said, look, everybody says you're this loving God and, and, and you're for us. And, and if, you know, we just reach out and ask you and we believe you'll, you'll fix things. But you didn't. You know, when the kid's dad left, you know, it was one thing for him to leave me, 
but to completely abandon his kids and never try to have a relationship with them, even though I tried to facilitate that, I'm like, you could have fixed that and you didn't. You hurt innocent children by not fixing it. And I don't forgive you for that. You know, I was just really hurt by it. And, and he was so compassionate. And, you know, I'm like, here this person throws this anger and vitriol at you. And you respond, you know, like a parent would to a two-year-old that's throwing a fit. You know, that's, that's their whole world. They want that cookie right now. And they don't understand that it's dinner time and it's not good for them. And you've got something that's going to nourish their body. They want what they want when they want it. And if you're not going to give it to them, they're going to raise holy hell, right? Well, you don't hate that child, you know, you scoop them up and you get their dinner and you love them and it's just a hard day. That's what he did, you know, he, he was like, let me show you something. You've completely misunderstood me. And so he shows me this scene. I'm sitting on these bleachers with my son at the ball field where my daughter played soccer and his little boy at the time when all of this happened was two. But in this scene, he's, he's five and I'm watching him run up and down the field and he's so alive and I can see, you know, his tan skin and the sun shining on his hair and just so vibrant, you know, and he's running up and down that field. And David looks at me. I never can get through this. I should just stop telling this part. David looks at me and he says, I'm going to be the dad to him that I deserved. And I was like, and I just looked at God and I'm like, oh, wow, you're breaking that cycle. You know, you're breaking the the, the cycle of what went on with my ex-husband's parents and what went on before them. And you know, how my parents struggled, you're, you're fixing it in this generation before my eyes. And I hated you for it. And I'm like, okay, you know, if we had to take the bullet for that, to, to stop it now, so that my grandkids don't go through it, and my great grandkids don't go through it, it was worth it. It was worth the suffering. I see beauty in this. And I, you know, it was just, it was just crazy to see it. You know, it's like when you're, when you're on the road and you're stopped and you're, you're leaning over to the side, you're trying to see, can you get around this person? What's going on up there? And you're getting more and more irritated. But the person who's up on the hills, like, oh my gosh, you know, I hope those people are okay. I hope they don't die. This is, this looks like a terrible accident. And they're praying for them while you're back here pissing and moaning. And that's God. He's up at the top. He sees it. And he's like, oh, gosh, I can totally understand where you thought that was a lack of love for you and your kids. Of course, that's what you would see down there. But let me show you. And then that verse just comes to me as I'm thinking it, you know, God turns all things to good for those who love him. And I'm like, even if you don't see it in this life, you know, you have to trust in that. So and that situation actually happened when Cole was five. It happened in real life. And it was such a validation for me that that all this had happened and I wasn't crazy. But so we're there and he shows me that. And I knew at that moment that we were going to go deep, but that I had to surrender to do it, you know. And that's something that's really hard for a single mom who's been divorced to completely make yourself vulnerable. I mean, even in my marriage, it's been something that I've really worked hard at because it's just, it's difficult. I tell people, you know, I was raped in college by a friend and all those little things add up. It's kind of that Maslow's hierarchy of needs. If safety isn't met, that's all you focus on is safety. And and everything else comes second. And so I just never felt safe. And Don was finally that person I could feel safe with. And and it was it was life changing for me. And and so there I am with this God who I've held responsible for all this stuff in my life. And he wants me to come with him, but I have to let him all the way in to do it. And so I was like, okay. Okay, I'm gonna trust you. And as soon as I said it, the light from him started swirling and it pooled at my feet and it started coming up through my feet and through my legs and it was so warm and it got up into my middle and you know where you have all that like visceral strain and nervousness and you know where you just feel sick about things. Like everything that ever happens to you, it leaves this little visceral physical imprint on you. It's it's in there. They're, they're like these little emotional scars. And his light was like this cloak wrapped around inside me and it was healing all those things. And it came up and it went around my heart and then it came up my neck and it went into my mouth and I started singing and I'm a horrible singer and it was beautiful. I'm like, oh man, this is cool. If I go back, I want to keep this one. And it, it, it just was incredible. And then it came up and it was, I could see, like feel it behind my eyes. And for some reason, I didn't want it to get out, and I thought I could contain the love of God, which is just so 
that's kind of cute, you know? And so I squeezed my eyes shut because I didn't want it to get out and it shot out my eyelids and out my eyelashes. And, and then it bounced off God's light outside me and it rushed back in and it went into my brain and I could feel it going through every curve in my brain. All the things, I knew all the things, all of them. I couldn't tell you what they are now, but everything, I understood everything. Everything made sense. And I was like, oh my God, like I knew that there were parts of my brain that I had never accessed before. And they were all working, they were all lighting up. And it was crazy because I could see things like flowers and and each flower had its own color and its own vibration. And God had a vibration, a resonance. And, and it was the key of G. And I didn't know what it was until I got back. And we were at church and this lady was playing this song in the key of G. And it it was such a strong reminder of what God sounded like that I had a hard time staying in my own body. I was like, okay, you know, you can't like pop out because you're at church and people think you're crazy and you already have social anxiety, so you don't want to add to that. <laughs> and um, and I asked Don, I'm like, what is that? Is that like a certain key or what? Because he's a musician. And he said, that's G. And I'm like, we have to go up there. So after church, we walked up there and I know she probably thought I was crazy. And and I put my hands on the piano and I stood close enough to it that it was touching my abdomen and the tops of my legs. And I'm like, will you play that again? And I said, I died. And um, I was with God and he, he resonates in the key of G. Could you play it again? And she did. She, you know, she honored that. And, and I could just feel it all over again. Like he was back in me with all of that love and light. And I'm like, wow, that's just... And I hadn't even put together that's what it was until then. So anyway, he's going through, he's up in my brain, I'm, I'm knowing all these things. And then he's going to take me on this trip and we're going to go through the strands of my DNA. And I'm like, I didn't even know you could do that. And I'm like, wow, this is just crazy. And so, you know, it's this, this spiral sort of thing and we're going through it and I can see, you know, the chromosomes, I can see my genetic code. And, and I can, as we're going through, I can feel the strands like, going over my skin, like, you know, like you'd stroke somebody that you love. And they're just brushing over me and we're going through and we're going through and then he stops. And it's like, and we were going super fast and, and he just suddenly stops and it was jarring. And I was like, whoa, what? And he's like, do you see me? And I'm like, well, yeah, I'd see you. You're everywhere. I mean, how would I not see you? And he's like, no. And he points at my DNA and he said, right there, do you see me? And I looked and it was God. I'm like, you're in my DNA? He said, I built you. I made you. He said, you you can no sooner deny that I am your father than that your physical father is your father. You can, you can say it's not true your whole life, but we can get your DNA and prove it so. I knit you together in your mother's womb. I am in you. You just had to remember it. And that's it. That's all of us. He's in there You just kind of have your slate wiped clean when you get here. And your whole journey is to figure that out, that he is in there. And how could you not love these people that you're in? You know, it's like, I never can understand how people can walk away from their children. I'm like, that's a little me. I made that person, you know. I I mean, I've wiped their butts. I know everything about them. I adore them. And in that moment, God adored me. Like he was so what is that word where you you first meet somebody and you're just so captivated by them and like everything they do is just wonderful and adorable and it's not love it's called adore it's like infatuation and but his wasn't um transient he was completely infatuated with me he thought i was funny he knew i was smart he it's like, you know, you go to pick your best friend up at the airport and they run off the, or your, your girlfriend or whatever, and they run off that airplane into your arms. And in that moment, just there's so much meaning. And that was him. He's not the one running off the airplane. He's the one standing there. He's like, man, I adore you. I am so excited to be here with you. You're awesome. And I thought, this is all on purpose. He made me on purpose. God, in everything that he has and in everything he had made before me, was a parent. You know, he was like, you know what? I'd love to have a little girl. And I'd give her dark eyes and dark hair and I'd make her silly and funny. And she'd have these weird fears of clowns and, you know, social phobias and stuff. And and she would be a bright light to the world. And I wondered how long, I wondered how long he dreamed of me before he actually set to making me. And then I wonder as, as he was knitting me together, 
You know, was was he thinking about all the good I'd do and all the trouble I'd get into as a little kid? And and still he kept sewing, you know, he kept knitting me together because I was on purpose, for a purpose, you know, and, and he knew what it was. And I was just like, that the God of the universe would put that much care and attention into just me. You know, if it'd been nobody else, it, it, he'd have done it for me. There's just no love like that, you know? So we get to that DNA and and I see him there and I realize I have to make this decision about going back and that it's my decision to make. But it felt like something, like a decision I had made before or something, like a, like I had preordained it or something. And I had to decide whether to go back and I didn't want to go. And initially my knee-jerk reaction was, no, no, of course I'm not going to go back. This is amazing. Yes, it's going to be hard on my husband and the kids, but they'll get here eventually. This is all over very quick. You have no idea how fast this goes, seconds. And, um, and I'm like, it all works out. They'll be okay. God will work it for good. And I just knew I was lying to myself. And I just, it just felt icky, you know, like, I don't know. It just felt bad. And I was like, Penny, he knit you together. He thought about you for a long time before he made you. And you got into that life and and you let hurt take over. And you built yourself a cell and you locked yourself away in it and you didn't really live. You know, and he designed you to live and he designed you to make a difference in the world. And yes, you can stay here now and he's not going to hold it against you. But can do you feel proud of what you did? You know, even though it wasn't my fault, it was my reaction. And and I was like, no, I, I feel like I've let him down. I feel like I haven't done everything that I could have done and, and like I haven't lived. And so I decided to go back. Well, as soon as I made the decision, I could feel him pulling away and it was just awful. It was like that baby being torn from its mother's arms. And I was like, wait, 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 you know, and I'm already crying. And and he's like, what? And And I said, let me remember it. If you don't let me remember it, I won't have any hope. Please let me remember it. And I woke up and I remembered it. And that nurse was sitting right there. And she's like, well, there you are. You're back. And I'm like, I was with God. Immediately you said that? First words out of my mouth. (laughs) I'm like, she says, what? I'm like, I was with, I mean, just now I was with God. And she's like, oh, that's nice, dear. And I'm like, in a religious hospital. She's like, let me go get your family. And I'm thinking, she thinks I'm crazy. I was really with God. So they come in, the family comes in, and I'm like, I was with God. I mean, just like a few minutes ago with him. And they're like, oh, that's good. And they're looking at the nurse like, is she going to be okay? Or, And she's like, well, let's not get her all excited. It's her first day off the ventilator, you know, so let's let's do some more visiting tomorrow and let her get some rest. And I'm thinking, man, I've been in a coma for how long? How much more rest do I need? And so they all leave and she she turns the lights off in the room and she actually closes the curtain so that you can't see through the glass doors. And I'm laying there in the bed and God comes to, into the room, like the light comes into the room, scares the crap out of me. I scream. And I'm like, oh, <laughs> he laughs. And he's like, what? And I'm like, well, I thought you were gone. He said, I'm never gone. I'm like, well, I know, but you don't just pop into rooms like that. That's startling, you know? And he thought it was hysterical. And um, he said, I want to give you this message and I want you to share it with the world. And so he gave me this message. I didn't have pen or paper or anything. I actually didn't get to write it down until the next day. And I remember as he said it to me, and then the next day as I heard it back and I was writing it down, I thought, I'm not sharing this with anybody. This is the most beautiful love letter and every, anybody's ever written me. And I want to have this for myself because I had so few things for myself. My whole life was taking care of my kids, taking care of other people, you know, I, I always said once my kids were grown, I would have matching clothes. I would have matching bras and panties. I would have matching pajamas. I would not wear t-shirts from the Goodwill anymore because, you know, that at that point I was going to value myself, which is crazy. Um, and I just, I just wanted to have, it was like this physical proof of that intimate connection. And so I want to say, <laughs> thinking, I don't think I shared that until summer of 2020. Um, after I got over COVID and I'd, and I'd almost died from COVID, the Dallas-Fort Worth Friends of IN's group had asked me to do a Zoom meeting and speak to their group. And I did. And, and before I did it, God was like, I asked you to share that and for you to continue keeping it to yourself as theft. And I'm like, all right, fine. You know, I'm not a thief. And, and so I pulled it up so I could read it to your folks. How long were you in a coma for? I think the first time, it all kinds of runs together because there were 18 and two and a half years. I think the first time 
like four or five days. I remember I was in the, when I woke up, my dad's birthday had already passed. So I can't remember if that was the first time or the second time, because I had like a, after the first time, like a week and a half or two weeks later, it happened again. Um, And those two run together. I can't remember. But most of the times were like four or five days. If they tried to take me off the ventilator before four or five days, I just would kind of crash and burn and have to be back on. How long did it feel like you were in this place? On the other side? Yeah. Can you even fathom how long it was? Or just, it seemed like forever. (laughs) The dark place, the void, if I had to put it in time that would make sense to you, I would say 10 years in the void. It felt like 10 years. Yeah. Good Lord. But time's different there. I mean, it's, it's like the, our perception of time. We measure time there the same way we measure it here, how it feels. And there it's just, it's different. But I mean, something that seemed to take a long time could go by and I would say it was like two seconds. It's just really weird. Uh, it's kind of like, the, you ever see the movie Interstellar? Is that the one where they're in space and... They were traveling through space, and even though like ten years passed on Earth, it was a lot faster for them from where they were. So I kind of was co- kind of correlating it to that, even though it was ten, we may say it was ten years, maybe it didn't feel like ten years. Yeah, there was a there was a movie. I thought it was Interstellar, where they're like one of them gets lost, like away from the ship, and they have to leave them. And I can't remember what movie that was, but I went and saw it with my sister in law, and there's this sound. So when they're when they're out of the spaceship, there's this sound, and I. I can't tell you what it is. You'd have to watch the movie. I'll pass on what it was. But there's nothing, but there's a sound to it. And when I heard that, I'm like, oh, that sounds like the void. I wonder if space really sounds like that. Yeah, I'm sorry for going off topic. I feel like you're about to give everyone the meaning of life and I'm, uh, <laughs> I'm delaying it way too much. No, not even close. Um, <laughs> no, I know. You're I'm just adorable, teasing. though. <laughs> okay, so this was the message he'd given to me. And then I've got one more thing to share with you. So when I had my near-death experience, God gave me this message to share with the world. God said, Such folly to think anything escapes my knowing. As when you were with me, all at once, all that I allowed you to know, you knew. No words were spoken, nor were they shouted. I whispered them to your spirit. I discreetly filled you with knowing. Knowing flowed into you as effortlessly as taking a breath. Is it not so? The great I am. No truer words have ever been spoken or written. The great I am is in your core. The great I am is the light. Even when I am hidden, still I am. As my energy charge sending me over each synapse in your brain, even those small fibers knew that I am. They rose and fell to the rhythm I created, to the symphony I composed, I conducted. I consider it a tragic comedy of arrogance when man denies what the smallest innervation knows. Man thinks he acts and moves outside my knowledge. How could it be so? I say, I proclaim, he does not. His own fibers clutch themselves, laughing at the idea. I am the flower, the wind, the rain, the sinew, the marrow, the rock, the author, the maker, the touch that set in motion all that you see and all that you know and all that you do not see or know. I knit you. I put breath in you. I am coated in every cell. Every nanosecond of time falls in step as I will it so. I am in you. I am in you. I am all. Even when you perceive nothing, still I am there. As I tell you this here and now, pressing my truth into your breast, your very heart presses it in further. Wait a minute. So that's that's the message that came to you all that that entire... How the hell did you remember that? That was what he gave me in the hospital room. Yeah. And it's funny because I remembered it the next day to write it down, even with fentanyl and whatever else was in my system. But I mean, now to this day, I still have to read it. But I remembered it perfectly that next day and wrote it down because I remember reading it to the nurse. As remarkable as those words are, that it's kind of like that says something. <laughs> the fact that you were able to write yeah. that down verbatim, like what does is, what is that just appear to you? You know what I mean? That that in itself is a miracle. It was like I was there again with him when I started thinking That's about it because I remember thinking I didn't have paper and I was really tired and I fell asleep before I realized it. And then when I woke up, it was the next day and I was like, oh my gosh. How am I going to share that? I'm not, I can't remember what he said. And so I asked for pencil and paper and I just closed my eyes and I, re- I wrote the whole thing with my eyes closed. It was all over the page and it, it was exactly what he had said. And I'm like, how is that? And it's funny. So I've been writing a book forever since then. A COVID hit and kind of totally threw me off track because I've been teaching on that ever since. It's so funny because when I'm writing, I'll look up and my hands will be so sore and ice cold and there'll be like 11 pages there that I don't remember writing. 
And I'm like, that's God. That's just the spirit of God moving through you and just kind of taking over the keyboard. And I always read it and I'm impressed. I'm like, wow, that's really good. You should write, you know, because <laughs> that's some just handy information. Out. So many questions, so much to, to unravel. But in regards to what does that experience do with your head moving forward about life in regards to specifically what's next? Like, does that give you comfort? Does that give you assurance as do you know what's, what you think is going to happen next? Are you at peace? Well, I'm not scared of dying. So that's, that's huge. for sure. The idea of death is so scary to people. And it's so nice to be relieved of that, to not have any concern for my safety or well-being, especially through this whole COVID thing, because I did a lot of deep research early on that, you know, was really making my husband nervous. He's like, I don't think you should be talking about this. And I'm like, well, I can't. And it was funny because I remember posting something just just kind of generic in, in my Twitter thing. And I think Dr. Fauci had said something like, um, he'd looked at the gain of function research and he knew it was dangerous and that it could leak, but he felt like it was worth it. And I'm like, okay, well, I wish we'd have had a say in that. Um, so I made this meme, and I'm not a good meme maker. I mean, apparently I am. Um, so you know, if you've seen Shrek, right? Of course. So that where Lord Farquaad's up on the balcony, and he's like, some of you, some of you will die, but that's a chance I'm willing to take, or that's a <laughs> sacrifice I'm willing to make. Well, I just took and I put Fauci's face on his, and I'm like, okay. So this one lady freaks out. She messages me, and she's like, you know. I didn't believe in God until I heard your story. And then I see this awful political thing you've done. And and I just, you know, I just can't even believe what you've said. I don't believe in God. And I'm like, oh, God. whoa, hold up there, girl. You know, <laughs> take a breath. I said, um, first of all, if your faith is that shaky, you got more problems than me. <laughs> and second of all, he actually said that. I just kind of reworded it a little bit. Like I didn't, because I'm not super political. Right. I'll speak on public health policy because I'm a nurse and I can't stop myself. But as far as politics, I think they're all pretty rotten, you know, and I, I just don't like any of them for the most part. But she was really upset about that. And so I told her, I said, it's interesting to me that you would think my having a near-death experience would somehow make me less opinionated about the truth. Yeah, do the opposite, shit. Right? Yeah, I'm like, I can't not say it because it's true. I, I have to say it. You know, people are being heard. I have to say something. Otherwise, I'm complicit. And and then I just typed in hashtag not your guru and I'm like, <laughs> that's good. if you're looking to me, <laughs> yeah, that, that's the that's the wild thing about what you went through. It's uh, I can see how I mean I can't see because obviously I haven't had that experience, but how being in a place like that, regardless of what it was, and coming back to reality, whatever the hell reality is, can be so confusing. Because ha after having experience like that, I'm, I'm seeing as like I probably have so many more questions about what what are we experiencing yeah. now? Because I feel like you've kind of seen maybe the finish line, maybe not, of course, maybe that's a poor way of saying it, but you've seen potentially yeah. what's next. And now you still have to live this life that I feel like to me that, that would, that would open Pandora's box of what the hell are we doing here? It's crazy. You know, I, I remember telling Don and being very tearful about it. And it's funny cause I was never a crier cause I bought, you know, I had a wall. <laughs> I don't do that. Um, but now I'm like so easily brought to tears and, and I just feel things cause I let myself and, and this whole thing happened with COVID and I got really sick. Like I was one of the first ones to get sick. I got sick March 12th, 2020, couldn't get a test, got meds initially. And then the protocol we had went to a lower dose. And within three days of the lower dose, I had relapsed. Well, I don't know what I was thinking, but when I got sick, most of the country had not seen COVID yet. And I'm like, okay, I'm a nurse with COVID. This is great insight for people who are going to be seeing this. It's coming their direction. And so I did almost every day of my illness, I did a live video, no matter what I looked like. And it got scary. I mean, I, I really did almost die. And I knew I, knew I wasn't going to go to the hospital. I had already signed a do not intubate order the last time I was intubated. And so I actually reviewed it with my doctor and with Don and said, I'm not going back to the hospital. They've said I will not survive the ventilator. There's no point in me going because that's all they're offering. And I don't want to die on a ventilator. I'd rather die at home. And so Don was like just freaking out and everybody watching is like, go to the hospital, go to the hospital. And like 86% of them are dying. No, I'm not going. So I got hydroxychloroquine, azithromycin, did the first day at the high dose, then went down to the lower dose within three days relapsed and was sicker than I was before. So it took me 53 days to recover, to come off oxygen, to stop having 102 temps every day. We figured out I had a mast cell activation disorder, 
which went into remission, and we should hit that real quick. So the last time, the 18th time that I went into respiratory failure, I was back with God again. And I told him, I'm like, I'm done. I, I don't know like what you're... And, and part of it was, is we never knew when it was going to happen. I could wake up in the middle of the night and be an anaphylaxis. We could be eating. They're like, you've got to be like intentionally taking something you're allergic to. And I'm like, why? Because ventilator drugs are so good? No, what the... <laughs> it's crazy. But you know, when they can't figure it out, they start grasping at straws, I guess. You know, I was back with God and I was just done. I'm like, I'm done. I can't do this anymore. And I told him, I'm like, I'm done. Just take me or heal me. I, I just, I can't do it anymore. I can't watch my family go through it. It's so scary. And, and he's like, it's not me, it's you. And I'm like, what do you mean? It's your God. You could so fix this. And he's like, it's not, it's not for me to fix. You said you were going to go back. You said you were going to live, but you're not, you're hiding still. You're not, I'm putting opportunities in front of you, people I need you to help, um, people I need you to share your story with, and you just keep saying no. If you want to live, then you've got to say yes. And I remember thinking, that is the most asinine thing I have ever heard. I'm like, so you're telling me that if I go back and I say yes, I'll be healed. And he's like, yes. I'm like, okay, fine. You're God. <laughs> like, could you be any less trusting than I am, right? I'm like, fine, fine. I'll go back and I'll say yes. So I wake up. My friend Brian is the first person who calls me, asks me to come to Cincinnati and do a talk. I say yes. I'm like, oh my God, hang up because I'm going to tell a lie to get out of it soon because I do not talk in front of people. And, and I did it. I went and I've said yes ever since. And we've not been in the hospital again. I mean, how do you explain that? God. That's it. Yeah, I think that kind of all goes back to what you said in the, uh, you know, one major lesson of your story regards to the power of thoughts. And I think the power of thoughts of how you perceive other people, of course, but even how you talk to yourself, the thoughts of that you're ingraining in your subconscious and the thoughts, the conversation you're having with yourself. And I mean, it starts on so many levels, but I think one of the big steps is the conversation and thoughts that you have with yourself. Yeah, well, I mean, you grow up from the time you're little believing that you're unlovable something's wrong with you. And, and, you know, and you have to fix that. You can't, you know, people seem to think, oh, you know, you get grown and you're just going to pretend that none of that happened. And, and I'm like, it doesn't work like that. You know, I mean, I love my mom. She is not the most maternal nurturing person. When Don called her to, and I only say this because I'm sure she'll never hear this broadcast, but, um, and we're not on the outs or anything, but when Don called her and told her that I was being life flighted, she's like, well, you know, keep us posted. She lived like five minutes from the hospital. She wasn't being mean or anything. It's just it didn't occur to her that she should go. And as a child, I still need that, you know. And and so God has been good to bless me with older female friends who have poured into me like that. Because, you know, I did deserve that. I did deserve to be loved and cherished and, you know, to have a cheerleader. And so I've got people in my life that do that now. And I really would encourage people to not assume that that's the end of your story, you know, that that was your childhood and that's the end of that story and you close that book. Find those people to help heal that because you deserve it. You deserve to be a loved child. I love that, Penny. I think that's the perfect way to put the cherry on top. What an amazing story. And there's obviously no surprise you've gotten so many views on this story because there's so <laughs> much there. There's a lot. I always pray. I'm like, God, tell me what this audience needs to hear because I'm like, I'm not going to keep telling the same story over and over again because. I mean, you can see that. Like, I don't understand the value in it, but I don't ever do an interview unless I've got 14 days before it. And every day I pray, I'm like, God, tell me what this audience needs to hear. What There's somebody here that needs something specific and I want you to guide me on what to focus on so that that person comes away with what they need. Because otherwise, me just telling my story and over, over and over is just noise, you know. It's got to change people for it to be meaningful for me. Yeah, well, clearly it's impacted people already. So I, I appreciate you putting that energy towards this podcast and this conversation. I'm definitely going to text my mom right after this and let me know that we just spoke to you because she's going to be excited yes. about that. <laughs> yeah, I'm but, uh, so What's your mom's name? Rosanna. Rosanna, that's lovely. I love that. Yay, Rosanna. I just feel like she's part of this bigger circle to help people. Yeah, my mom's a, my mom's a bull. She's the, you know, the, the biggest reason why I'm even here today besides maternally. <laughs> yeah, those single moms that have to, you know, kind of get through especially tragedy, you know, losing your dad. and Yeah, she, she did it with flying colors. She's incredible, seriously. It's, it's, it's a whole other podcast talking about that woman. But Penny, thank you so much. Is there anything that you want to say before we get out of here? Yeah, so I've got the webpage. It's called withhealthcoaching.com and it's W-I-T-T. -T. And on there, there's like the protocol, the over-the-counter protocol for the COVID stuff and the jabs and all of that. And if 
I'm getting ready to put some stuff up for some long haulers. Then there's, we've just added a new section. So we're getting ready to put content into it, but there's a new section. So it's body and then it's mind and spirit. And we'll be adding stuff there. I'll be starting my YouTube and Rumble channel soon. And those will be life from a near death perspective, you know, and how can we, how can we look at life and make decisions from that perspective so that we're always making decisions with the goal in mind and not just randomly stumbling through life. Stumbling through life, having a goal creates that order that is so important. You know, and I've never really, I mean, it took me some time to realize the importance of setting a goal. As cliche as that sounds, there is a reason for that. <laughs> so There really is. It gives you direction every day, you know, and you don't wander through just feeling like you have no purpose. Right. Because you can see yourself getting closer and closer. Yeah. And by the way, purpose, I, I know we're wrapping this up, but what's really stuck to me is that idea of, uh, you know, I feel like we're running through life always looking for a purpose. And that hit me at home too, because I've always put so much focus on what's my purpose? Why am I here? What should I be doing? What one thing should I be doing with that? To kind of go back to what you said about there's always something presented in front of you that day that could be your purpose for that moment or for that day, as little as 73 cents or 72 cents, whatever it was, as little as that. It's like, that is your purpose. That day-to-day stuff can be your purpose. Mm-hmm. doesn't always have to be, be well, Leonardo DiCaprio starring in a, in a movie or whatever the hell right, you know, your, right. your real life drive is. That's one thing, but you know the little things really matter too. Well, and the fun thing about that is, um, you know, we get very regimented. And you have this idea of what you're good at and what you think you should be doing. Believe me, none of this is what I thought I would be doing two years ago. When co- I mean, I didn't think I would buy one of these microphones or do any of this kind of stuff because I have social anxiety. And, and so of all the things that I was like, oh, I could do this and this would help people. And God's like, wait, I know. <laughs> let's take the thing that scares her the most and let's let her do that. But he's brilliant because... He's taken somebody with crippling. So, I mean, my biggest battle is the front door. If I can get on the other side of it, I'm okay. I will invariably think of anything I can to not have to get on the other side of that door. It is so anxiety provoking for me. Well, now I've been able to so much work on that kind of anxiety in a safe space by doing videos and, you know, talks and stuff. And now a person with crippling social anxiety is doing a podcast and has her own. And, I, you know, who would have seen that coming? God's just, I mean, he's, he's just funny that way. He's like, yeah, watch this. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, would, I would bet money that, uh, that Noah couldn't swim and was afraid of water. I just, I got to think so. I mean, I think there's, some, I think there's something else. Maybe that's why uh, fear is fear and it's, it can't be too easy, right? Otherwise, where's the fun in yeah. that besides anything yeah. else? Yeah, well, it, it grows you. It, it forces you to change. We want comfort and it's not part of it. You, God is always bringing something new and you, you learn you have these talents that you didn't know you had. And it's just super cool. I'm like, okay, what are we going to do today? And if you can approach life that way, it is so much more gratifying than, oh, I have to do this today, which we all do. But you know, what, what, oper- what are you going to put in front of me today? I'm watching. What are you going to give me today? And invariably he'll, he'll do it. Well, I love what you're doing. Um, you know, you're so well-spoken, you're intelligent, you're hilarious too, by the way. <laughs> so there's, I love the humor in there. So keep doing what you're doing. Um, I can't be more thankful for you taking this time. Uh, there's definitely a lot of good information here, amazing story and a lot of lessons. So I'm, I'm proud of what you've become and what you're doing. And I'm happy to have connected. So I can't thank you again, Penny. Thank you.